Yeah, it's such a delight for me to come and share God's word with you. And uh, I'm very grateful to Pastor Chadwick for giving me this privilege. Uh, we have known each other for a long time. And I, I, I love this, your pastor. I love him and his beautiful team. Pastor Joshua here and other friends, so many. And I'm so delighted to be with you, share God's word with you. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Paul's letter to Titus. Titus chapter 2. The Christian faith is centered around the Lord Jesus. He's a Lord, Savior, creator of the universe. He's a Lord and Savior. But after the Lord Jesus, I would like to argue that the most important other person for our faith is the Apostle Paul. And the reason is, even though he was not one of the twelve, not one of the many, when Jesus was physically present and teaching, he, because of the writings of Paul, has become very important for our faith. So whether we recognize it or not, Paul is our first pastor. We are all spiritual children of Apostle Paul. And in the providence of God, Paul wrote many letters, we don't know how many, but these 13 letters are there in your New Testament, right? And just to let you know that these letters are collected in the providence of God. We don't really know who went around collecting these letters. And remember in those days to collect a letter, you had to go to some place and then you'd write the whole thing down to make one copy. There was no photocopying, no, you could not just take a screenshot of it. You had to sit and write the whole thing. And so some people did that and made copies and copies and collected it. And these unnamed heroes are the reason we have these letters of Paul in our New Testament. Just to let you know that these 13 letters of Paul are arranged in a very simple particular order. They are arranged not according to chronology or importance. They are arranged according to length. Just all. Just like in kindergarten, when our teacher got us to stand in line, how did they say, hey, Lambu, you go in the back. Sorry, those who don't understand Hindi, Lambu means a tall fellow. So it's according to height. So the first nine letters are to churches. And please note, they are all according to length. So you have Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And the next four letters are to individuals, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, which is the shortest. That's how they are arranged for us in the New Testament. We are picking up one of those letters of Paul. Titus is a chota wala, it's a small letter. But just like everything else in the world, meanings always come from the context. That's one of my passions in life, is to teach people to read the Bible. The problem is, most, most of us, we don't read the Bible, we read verses. So we all have a disease I have called versitis. What is versitis? You run with a verse. I can do all things with a verse taken out of context. So I just get people, read the Bible. Read the passage. Read before, behind. Even remember that the chapter divisions came later. 1200, uh, 1200s, and the worst divisions came later in the 1500s. So, simple, read the Bible, context. But if I read the whole of uh, uh, Titus today, it'll take a while. So that's your assignment after your afternoon nap. You get up and you have your evening tea. Sit down and just slowly read this short little letter. I'm a teacher, I give assignments. All right, so that's your assignment. And uh, when you finish your assignment, tell your somebody, your friend or your wife or your husband or somebody that you did it, okay? And I'll be happy. Let's stand together and read Titus chapter 2, verses 9 to 14. Whichever version you have it in, if you don't have it on your, on your device or in your hands, um, you can read it as it comes on screen. We're going to read just one section of it from verse, chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verses 9 to 14. Are you ready? Read along with me. Read it whichever version you have. Yes, start. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them. 
and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Titus was a very beloved colleague of Paul. He's one of those guys, if you read in the beginning, he's called my son, Titus. Paul speaks of many people as son, you know, because there's an affection with his colleagues. By the way, Paul was not a one-man army like you have in Bollywood and Tollywood. You know, the hero comes and with the left hand, he does 10 people fall on this side. Paul was an ordinary person like you and me but he was a leader of a team. Several of his teammates are mentioned in the letters and in the book of Acts. So he was not this one great gifted man, Apostle Paul International Ministries. Not that, that's not the best way to do it. You work as a team because you know why God is a team? God is a team, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so it's not me and myself and my ministry or whatever. It's our work. We always have to work as a team. And so Paul, this guy, is a precious colleague of Paul. He is also a good troubleshooter for Paul. So here is a problem. You read, this is in a context. It's a first century context. There are several churches on the island of Crete, as you read the beginning chapter. And there are problems in those house churches. There's no big church like this anywhere in the first century because they meet in homes. You can't have, a, you know, a thousand people meeting in a home. And so in these house churches, they are, you know, leaders are there, elders who are leading the church. Unfortunately, some of these leaders have gone berserk. They've gone crazy. And Paul has to send him, he said, go and put these things in order. What is the main problem? Two things. Number one, they are teaching crazy stuff. Unbalanced or not sound teaching. Unhealthy teaching. Secondly, there is something driving them to teach this. Look at chapter 1, verse 7. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. Simple money. Their passion is for money. Their preaching is for money. And that completely messes up the gospel. And so Paul says, go and rebuke them. And if they don't listen, remove them. And put faithful people who can teach the gospel properly. So it's a hard work. Sometimes we think, you know, first century church was very nice. Only we have problems in present day churches. That's not reality. Wherever human beings are going to be there, you're going to have messes in our families and in our churches. You have to keep working with it. And so Paul sends Titus to take care of it. That's chapter one. And then Paul will talk about there should be healthy teaching, sound teaching. You look at the Tamil, it will talk about healthy teaching. You know, it is to do with sound is just, by the way, sometimes Pentecostals think sound means volume. <laughs> There's more volume means it's correct. No. Just because you shout doesn't mean it is right. Okay. It's about healthy teaching. That's why, you know, we talk about sound health. The verb used there is hugiano, from where you get the English word hygiene. You see, so healthy teaching is a need of the church. Not just something that, you know, we love it. You know, French fries. Anybody here who doesn't like French fries? You know? But is it healthy? Especially if you choose to do it morning, afternoon, evening. And so, 
healthy teaching is a need of the church and Paul is going to encourage Titus. Go and settle the problems there in that church. And so in chapter 2, if you're looking at chapter 2, he gives some instructions. Not that uh, Titus doesn't know this, okay? These are reminders. Even what I'm going to tell you is going to be a reminder. It's not that you have never heard about this, what I'm going to tell you. And the reminders are, okay, tell the older women in the churches to behave like this. You'll be surprised. Some of the older women have a problem with alcohol. <laughs> yeah. So he says, tell them to be controlled. Don't hit the bottle so hard. And, and then he says, let them teach the younger women to do what? See verse 4, chapter 2 verse 4. He says, uh, so that then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. What do you think younger women means? What is the young age? What is the age you think they are, younger women? What age do you think they get married in those days? What age did your great grandmother get married? Huh? 15, 16, you are teenagers, you get married, right? So basically, you're a teenager. 2000 years ago, what do you do? You get married, you get your girls married. What did I do with my daughter? I sent her to college. And, and right? And my mother, when she was 20, she went to Jaffna in Ceylon in those days to be a teacher. Taught from 1948 to 55, 55 to 57, she taught in Tutukorin. At the age of 29, she gets married, my mother. So she didn't follow this. So basically, what you have in these commands are culturally conditioned commands. When you and I read the scriptures, we have a task, that is, try our best to understand what the text meant to them there and then, and then grapple with it in a community and say, okay, so how does it apply to us here and now? That is the hard task of reading and applying the Bible. We just don't take a verse in the, oh, it's in the Bible, so we, no, we don't. I provocatively like to say, we don't follow the Bible. We follow Jesus. And the Bible helps us to follow Jesus. Okay? We don't take verses, you know, disjointed verses from here. And say, oh, it's in the Bible, so we follow. No, that's not the way to do it. The Bible is a guide. It's a compass. It's not a Google map. It guides us in the direction to go. And then we have to struggle and grapple with these teachings. And so in passing, Paul will talk to another group of people, a reality in that church. Verse 9, which group of people is in verse 9? You can speak back to me. Verse 9, slaves, a reality. And I know some of you working in IT and big companies, you think you are slaves to your company. <laughs> you're, you're willing slaves. Okay, you're paid well, all right. But in those days, these slavery, nobody chooses to be a slave but there were slaves. And many slaves found the gospel attractive. It gave them some purpose and meaning and hope in life. And there were some masters who had slaves who also became followers of the gospel. And so Paul in verse 9 will say, slaves, be good slaves. He's not saying that slavery is good, okay? In fact, in another passage in 1 Corinthians 7, he will say, if you slaves can get your freedom, go for it. But if you don't get it, don't think you're finished. Life is more than your present situation. There is an age to come. Work for that. And so Paul will say to, the gospel, to these slaves, he says, live in such a way that your, your, your masters, who may not be followers of Jesus, who are not in the gospel, they will find your gospel attractive. Look at verse 10. So that they will make the teaching about our God, our Savior, what? Attractive. Now, you know, the, Paul is not writing in English or Tamil. He's writing in Greek. And he uses a common Greek verb, cosmeo. Cosmeo, from where you get your cosmetics, all right? It makes to make something beautiful, to adorn something, to put in a certain order. All right, so that verb is used about 10 times in the New Testament. Paul is saying to the slaves, live in such a way that you make the gospel look beautiful. My message today to you is the beautiful gospel. This is a gospel that is beautiful. And for us to enter into this gospel and embrace this gospel and follow this beautiful Jesus, we will become beautiful. That's the calling on our lives, to become beautiful people. See, in the Bible, 
uh, in the New Testament, the people of God are called a bride. That's there in the Old Testament too. Israel is called a bride of God. And they're a beautiful bride. Revelation 21. The beautiful bride adorned for the master. Who's, the, who's our bridegroom? The Lord Jesus. And that's the imagery that we have. Becoming beautiful. But the question is, how does God make his people beautiful? So I'm going to give you four words in English. G, 4G. I know it's not 5G. I don't make, not make the sermon longer. Okay, 4G. It begins with God. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, just to let you know, the verses 11, 12, 13, 14. I know you have four verses there. These verses were not put there by Paul. They came later, hundreds, just 500 years ago. And um, they are actually one long sentence in Greek. So if you just take one verse out of it, you're not listening. I mean, my wife is saying something. I hear one fourth of it and I think she's talking about this and she's talking about something else because I don't listen. I know we husbands, many of us don't know how to listen. After 35 years, I still am trying to listen. It's not easy because we don't read or listen carefully. And the same thing with us. We use verses without reading the Bible. The simple principle I tell people, read the Bible. You know, I know I have a lot of friends who keep every morning, they will send me a Bible verse. So many groups, you know, this verse, uh, nice, cute. Sometimes it may be nice, you know. But that's not even one sentence sometimes. So, somebody said, you know, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. So, read the Bible. So, what is he saying here? For, he says. You know, when he comes to that word for in the Greek, it's a simple word, gar. Gar is a post, uh, particle, which means what I have told you now I'm going to give you the reason after this, after God. Because, all what I has told you, how do you make the gospel beautiful? By this, this is the way a gospel becomes beautiful. God, the grace of God has appeared that gives salvation to all people. All right. So, number one, God. It's God who always takes the initiative. You know, you are, I are here today because God brought us here. I know you decided to come and some of you may say, I am so tired. Yesterday was a very tiring day. Uh, I really wish, but I, anyway, somehow let me push myself. You came. Yeah, but it's God who brought you. You may not recognize. I may not recognize. God takes the initiative always to create and to redeem. God takes the initiative. That's what God is. So in the Old Testament, when there is a mess, the story of Genesis 1 to 11, the mess has come to Babel. And God chooses a man out of Babel or Babylon. He chooses a man, Abraham, Genesis 12 verse 3, to bless the whole world. God takes the initiative to bless the whole world through Abraham's descendants, that is Israel. That's God's initiative. And then God reveals himself as a God of compassion and mercy. I know if... Sometimes we read the Old Testament and you think, man, God was pretty hard in those days, right? And some of us say, thank God, God got converted in the New Testament. <laughs> he, Jesus, he's come as Jesus now. And no, that's because we have not read the Old Testament well. If you want to understand one of those places where God reveals himself, one of my favorites is Exodus 34 and verse 6. Exodus 34 verse 6. I'm always nervous when I'm introduced uh, because I tell them, please keep to these basic things which are facts. Don't say things my wife will not recognize. <laughs> right? And so, what does God, how does he reveal himself to Moses? Exodus 34 verse 6, he says, the Lord, the Lord, Adonai. And then the first thing about God is what? Compassionate. Rakum, that's the Hebrew word. You know, it's connected to in the many of the Semitic languages, Arabic and uh, Urdu and all that, through Rahem. Rahem is mercy. It, it talks about the womb of God. God has a womb. God feels here. God, that's how God is. That's the primary characteristic of God. Compassionate. Gracious, that's the next thing. 
forgiving, forgiving all kinds of wickedness. And then there is justice also at the end because justice has to be there. God is the one who always takes the initiative. You know, my favorite parable, I was almost tempted to preach on that and Luke 15, the parable we have been calling the parable of the prodigal son, Ketta Kumaran, right? That's because we have not read the whole parable properly. The parable is not about one son. It's about two sons, by the way. And it's actually about a father. So that whole, all the three parables are about not the lost sheep, not the lost coin, not the lost son. It's about a seeking shepherd, a searching woman, and a loving, gracious father. He's mad. Who will do that? Your father won't do that. You go blow up your father's money, come back, he will welcome you with five-star hotel party. He's crazy if he does that, right? That's what God is. Jesus' parable is there to reveal to us God, a God of crazy love, incredible forgiveness. One of the greatest biblical scholars was a man called David Noel Friedman. He came from a Jewish background. He knew the Hebrew scriptures so well that if you talked about the Old Testament, probably the text you talk about, he will recite in from memory in Hebrew. He knew the scriptures so well. I'm talking about the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. One day somebody asked him, Dr. Friedman, if you were to summarize the whole of the Hebrew scriptures, how would you put it? You know, he said, simple, there is forgiveness. That was the summary of one of the greatest scholars of the Bible, the Old Testament. There is forgiveness. What a liberating truth that is. And that's what an unknown psalmist has said in Psalm 130 verse 3 and 4. Oh Lord, if you kept a record of my sins, who can stand? This preacher can't stand here if God keeps a record of my sins. But with you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are reverenced. Hallelujah. You are here because there is forgiveness. That's God. And this God is the God of grace. So the first G is God. The second G is grace. But what, what is this grace? Forgiveness? One of the finest, famous German theologians who stood up to Hitler and lost his life at the age of 39, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. One of his books, some of you who are interested in reading, can pick up his book, The Cost of Discipleship. It's, it's a classic. You must read it. The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In that, he talks about grace. He says, sometimes we people of God can think about what he calls cheap grace. What is cheap grace? He defines it like this. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Cheap grace is grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. But then he says, the grace of God is a costly grace. Very costly. You know, when in our house we are dealing with something very costly, we say, be very careful with this. It's very costly. It's very costly. Costly grace is costly because it costs God everything. It's not cheap. It cost a man, a person, his life. This grace will cost you our lives. It's not an add-on something that you can choose to have or not have. This is at the center of our existence and of our relationship with God. It's grace because it gives us the only true life. So, God who works through us through grace. How does God make us beautiful? It's His chosen way is working in our lives through grace. A costly Grace, a grace that demands everything of mine. Not just a little of my time, all my time. Not just a little of my money, all my money. Not just a little of my mind, all my mind. Like we sang. It's a costly grace. But what does this grace do? Two things, two consequences of this grace. Look at verse 12. 
It teaches us. What teaches us? The grace of God. It has appeared, brings salvation to all people. It teaches us to do, to do what? To say no. The ability to say no. My children tells me, Dad, you don't know how to say no when somebody asks you for something. <sighs> and I say yes to this, I say yes to that. I have to say no. But we are talking now about the world. No to ungodliness and worldly passions. The follower of Jesus, as they follow Jesus, there will be a lot of allurements and attractions. The world with the glitter and the glamour and the power and this loud voice will invite us into what looks good, the glitter, the power of the world. But the grace of God will say, say no. The grace of God will empower us to say no to what we discern is the world. Sometimes I know God's people make mistakes thinking the world means something external. The world means you don't put on this color or something like that. Or you have a certain hairstyle or you don't have a certain hairstyle. I don't have to worry, I don't have hair left now. See? What is the world? The world is not something on you. It is something in you. That's why Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2, Paul will say, do not be conformed to this world. Don't have the shape. Don't let the world shape your thinking. But be transformed by the shaping of your mind, by the renewing of the mind. So scripture, as we meditate on it, the gospels, the life of Jesus, the life of Paul, they shape our thinking so that now we are shaped into the shape of godliness. But what is godliness then? Simple. Godliness, the Bible defines as Christ-likeness. A godly person is Christ-like. And so we are called to become Christ-like. The Apostle Paul will talk about walking in the Spirit and we become Christ-like. Let me just read for you a passage from chapter 3 here. We are in Titus, so very much in the same context. Chapter 3, verses 4 onwards. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. If you had seen chapter 2, verse 13, there it says, the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there Jesus Christ is called Savior. Look at chapter 3, verse 4. God is called our Savior. He saved us. Who saved us? God. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy, grace. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So how does God save us? He washes us by the Holy Spirit. That's the other metaphor here. Whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, according, having the hope of eternal life. God wants His heirs to look good. You know, a parent would like their children to dress up well and say, this is of my children. Wow, nice, they look nice. God wants us, His children, to look good, to look beautiful. That's His plan. That's God's plan. God's plan is not to whisk us away to some place called heaven when we die. He has something far better than that. God's plan is to make us beautiful and to beautify the gospel so that we are beautiful people of God. We are heirs that God is proudly showing us off. That is God's plan. How does he do it? That, did you notice the triune God is involved here? You see, the, the teaching on the Trinity is not found in, okay, Paul doesn't say, now I'll teach you about Trinity. But there are tons of places where he just talks about something and he talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in different order. 
There's no fixed hierarchy among the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No fixed hierarchy. The triune God. And did you notice how we become beautiful? Did you see in verse 5? By the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit has brought us here today. The Holy Spirit is right here with us and in us. And the Holy Spirit will walk with us back home. And the Holy Spirit will keep working on us to make us beautiful. The Holy Spirit is the divine beautician. Because He loves us so much that He does not want us to live with our ugliness for too long. And we know our ugly spots and people we lived with also know our ugly spots. But the Holy Spirit doesn't want to leave us there. He loves us too much for that. God is in the beauty business. God wants to make us beautiful. That's God's plan. The Holy Spirit not just gives us empowerment, but the Holy Spirit makes us holy. <laughs> right? Makes us godly. That's why the Holy Spirit is given. To transform us, to make us holy. So, three G's. Number one, God. Number two, number three, godliness. What is godliness? Christ-likeness. So let me tell you a story. This is one of the old stories that comes from the end of the 19th century. Maybe the mother's story of many of the stories like Beauty and the Beast and Sleeping Beauty and all that. It's a story, okay? It was a, a man called Max Beerbohm. He wrote this story. He called it the happy hypocrite. Ever thought of putting those two words together? Happy and hypocrite? Yeah, it's the story. It's called the happy hypocrite. A fairy tale for tired men. That's what he called it. So, by the way, there are a lot of women also here. So this story for all, not just tired men, but tired women or whoever you are. If you're not tired also, it's, it's for you. It's a story. So you need to switch on your imagination. Are you ready? Switch it on. Lord George Hell. His name is Hell, okay? George Hell was a rich man. But he was one of the most selfish rascals that ever existed. He was selfish to the core. He doesn't bother. He would cheat if he wanted playing cards with his friends. He'll cheat them to make money. He even supposedly took a castle from one of his friends because he cheated him. And so he had this girlfriend, Lagambogi. And one day he was in watching a, a production on the stage. And as he was watching, suddenly there was a, this simple, beautiful little girl on the stage, Jenny Mayer. She was just doing her part. And the moment he saw her on the stage, something happened. Doop! And he said, Who's this girl? And soon after the play, he went backstage and he tried to meet her and this poor little girl looked at this big lord coming to her and he said, oh, I love you. And she was scared. She looked at him. I just told you, you have to switch on your imagination. He's a sinner. So how does he look? He looks like a sinner, right? Yeah. He looks like a sinner. He is a sinner. And Jenny looks at him and says, sorry, sir, please forgive me, but I have to marry someone who looks like a saint. And he's heartbroken. He knows he doesn't look like a saint, right? He says, I cannot live without her now. And he walks out into the streets, into the streets of London and he's walking in the night and he doesn't go to sleep and he's wondering, what do I do? I don't look like a saint. And an idea strikes him. You see, in that city, they had an expert mask maker who could make any mask you asked for. And so he waited for the mask maker to open his shop and he walked into the shop and said, I want you to make a mask for me. And he looked at him. Yes, Lord George. Remember what's his full name? George Hell. Yeah. What do you want? He said, I want the mask of a saint. <sighs> the man looked at him. Okay. And he goes up in his attic and he starts looking for masks that would fit him and finds the right one. And he comes and puts it on him. <sighs> oh, 
George cannot believe. He looks at the mirror. He cannot believe his appearance. He is a saint. But remember, he is a hypocrite because this is not what he is. And so now he goes to the place where he heard Jenny lives and he finds Jenny. And he goes before Jenny and Jenny sees the saint coming to her. And he says, Jenny, I want to marry you. And she sees a saint and she says, yes. And Jenny falls in love with him and they get married and they are happy. And George does everything that Jenny wants because he loves Jenny. And he's enjoying his life and he's doing whatever Jenny wants. And several months pass by. One day, Jenny wanted to eat something specific. They went to the, uh, to the city. I'm cutting short the story here. And there suddenly when they were sitting in the park, a woman from his past saw him. La Gambogi. She looked at that man and said, there is something so familiar about that man. She kept coming closer and closer and looking at him and Mm. She said, I think I know who this is. This is that George who left me and ran away. And she goes towards him and says, George. And he saw her coming and he begged her, please leave us alone. Please, he begged her, leave us alone. And Jenny doesn't know what is happening. And he come, she comes and says, I know who you are. You are George Hell." You must be having a mask on. Jenny is shocked. Mask? And he says, please leave me alone. Please leave us alone. She does not. She like a tigress comes at him and she starts pulling his mask off. And in front of her, traumatized Jenny, the mask is pulled off and it's on the floor. Jenny is shocked. He is horrified. He says, you have destroyed my life. And then this Lagambogi looks at his face. She is also shocked. Because when that mask is pulled off, his face has become that of a saint. You see, you can switch off now. When we put on Jesus, we are all hypocrites. We are not yet like Jesus, but we put on Jesus. We get baptized, you're putting on Jesus. You say, I believe in Jesus, you're putting on Jesus. But along the way, as we seek, as we fall in love with this Jesus and this triune God who has loved us, and we seek to follow what would please them, we are being transformed into the image of our beautiful Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That's the good news. This grace leads us to godliness. One of the great Russian masters, a Christian, Orthodox Christian called Fyodor Dostoevsky, Maybe if you're a literature person, you have come across. If not, maybe you should read one of his books. Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote many books and one of his famous books is called The Idiot. And the main character there is a very innocent man. He's the Christ figure in that book. Prince Mishkin. And in the story, long into the story, I struggled to read that. It's a long book. Long into the story, he says something and the people recognize it. He says, beauty will save the world. Beauty will save the world. You see, our God is the only source of all truth, goodness and beauty. God is the source. If ever you see goodness, truth and beauty anywhere, only God can be the source. It may look like God is not, but God is the source of all truth, goodness, beauty. 
And of course, the epitome of truth, goodness, beauty is in God, our triune God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what God is trying to do among his people. Unfortunately, we Christians do not have a monopoly on goodness and beauty. We don't have a monopoly on that. Because God wants to bring truth and goodness and beauty into the world. If we are not ready, he will use others to bring truth, goodness, beauty into the world. Grace leads to godliness. But I want to end with one more G. Very important. Look at chapter 2 and verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Goodness. God, grace, godliness, goodness. There is a focus on doing good in this short letter. Paul uses two Greek words to talk about this goodness. Agathos and kalos. Kalos is like, like we say calligraphy, beautiful handwriting, writing, correct? So kalos and agathos both mean good. So about nine times these two words are used in this letter. There is a focus on doing good. Look at chapter 3 verse 14. 3.14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. God wants us to do good. When the worship leader comes and says, God is good, what do you all say? And then he says, all the time, what do you all say? You know why? Why do you say that? Why don't you say, when he says God is good, why don't you say Amen? Thanks to Don Moen. <laughs> Don Moen taught us to say God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. So let's do it this time, okay? And be ready for the next one. God is good. All the time. All the time. We are good. <laughs> At times. And our wives will tell us when we are good once in a while. But God wants us to be good all the time because God is good. We are worshipping that God. That's why in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, very well-known verse, we are God's handiwork. God is working on. Imagine all billions of us, God is not going to leave any one of us. He's going to work on us till the beauty of Jesus is seen in our lives. He's not going to give up on me because I'm crazy, I'm stupid sometimes. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2.10, to do good works. The purpose why God is working is so we should be doing good works. All of us, the billions of us followers of Jesus, we should be involved in billions of good things. Each one of us in our own setting doing good. We are not saved by good works, by doing good works. We are saved for doing good works. And every one of us in our own circles, you just need to be open to the spirit, the good spirit who will lead you into doing good, all kinds of good. Goodness is God's calling in our life. Adorned by goodness. Beauty and goodness are integrally related. That's why at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18, Paul will say, command those, the rich people, to do good, agathos, to be rich in good, kalos, good deeds, beautiful things, and to be generous and to be willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. Pursuing good, that's the calling. You know, Indians, there are only five Indians have got a Nobel Prize till now. Only five. 1913, Rabindranath Tagore for literature. 1930, C.V. Raman for physics. And then Mother Teresa, 1979, for peace. And then uh, Amartya Sen, 1998. And the last Indian to get a Nobel Prize 
was in 2014. Who was that? How many of you know who, who is the Indian who got the last Indian who got the Nobel Peace, uh, Peace Prize? How many of you have heard of Malala Yousafzai? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, the, the sad part is Malala is not from India. We know about Malala, but the Indian who got alongside her, we don't know about him. Kailash, thank you. Kailash Satyarthi. Find out. Find out what he was, why did he receive the good news? And also figure out why is it that we in India don't talk about him much. There is something very interesting, ideological, where the government doesn't push his name. Otherwise, we should be proudly talking about him, right? Because he fought against child slavery. He has rescued 80,000 children from child slavery. Watch a documentary on his life on YouTube. It's called The Price of Free. Watch that. Kailash Satyarthi. He doesn't claim to be a follower of Jesus. I don't know whether he is. But goodness. God's goodness coming through. He has risked his life to go after serving people. Are you and I willing to do that? We are followers of the one who risked his life, gave his life to do good to make this world beautiful. Are you and I willing to follow in his trail? 2018, one of the Nobel Peace Prize winners was this Dr. Dennis Mukwege from Congo. He's a gynecological surgeon. His job is to reconstruct the mutilated bodies of women because they have been raped and mutilated. 40,000 surgeries. Sometimes he does 10 surgeries in a day. He happens to be a Pentecostal pastor's son and he happens to be a Pentecostal pastor too. He's a surgeon and a Pentecostal pastor together in the Panzi Hospital, which is run by a Pentecostal church. Goodness, God's goodness. I know I'm picking up a few people, there are many. Grace leads to godliness and grace will lead us to goodness. So that our lives, are, we are thinking about how we can do good for others. Because... God is good. How do we become good? It's when we yield our life to the good spirit, the beautiful spirit. And then, you know what the Holy Spirit will do? He will up start applying cosmetics on us. The cosmetics of self-giving love. We don't know that, okay? We have to learn that from Christ. Self-giving love. Humility. Gratitude, love, forgiveness. Even those who have hurt us. We don't keep repeating stories for 40 years. Somebody did something to us. We are free to serve. Generosity. So I'm going to ask you to sing along a very simple chorus with me. Thank you so much for being ready with it. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me all his wondrous compassion and purity O thou spirit divine all my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me are the words coming up there it's a very simple chorus maybe some of the oldies here may remember this others you can learn it is very simple I'm going to lead you in that and soon when you learn that next time we'll stand and we'll sing it as a prayer. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me All His wondrous compassion and purity Be seen in. That's the project of God to make this world beautiful, and He is enlisting you and me as we follow the beautiful one, the Lord Jesus. And if you can make that your prayer, the Spirit will come upon us 
and make us beautiful so that the gospel we embrace the gospel we stand for the gospel we share will be a beautiful gospel to the world stand to your feet as we sing this as a prayer let the beauty of jesus be seen in me all his wondrous compassion and purity oh thou spirit divine all my nature refine till the beauty of jesus be seen O thou spirit divine O thou spirit divine all my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me